Hello, my name is Paul Cunningham. I'm a political editor with RT, and I'm delighted to moderate this afternoon's um, session. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments, then we will open it up to our guest speakers. They'll speak for 10 minutes each, and then we'll open it out onto the floor. Um, the big discussion, obviously, is the future of Europe, but what I'd like to try and do is hark back just one moment to the year of 1976, when Jean Monnet said, Today, no one can say what form Europe will assume tomorrow for the changes born of change are unpredictable. And just looking at the Italian elections seems to prove the case once again. So let's take it and that Europe is changing, and the question for us is how we want to shape that future together. And Ireland is trying to play a significant role in that debate. And uh, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar was addressing the European Parliament earlier on this year, and he was trying to give the Irish perspective on things. So it might be just worthwhile to review for our guests about how he sees things going forward. Um, he told the uh, European Parliament that Ireland is at a decisive point in its history, and I think everyone would agree with that, that Ireland as a country has benefited so much that it has a responsibility to lead the debate. So Irish politicians are going to be travelling around Europe selling that message, and that we should be positive talking about what we want to achieve rather than um, what we want to block. And what was noticeable for me, and I was there in the hemicycle in Strasbourg on that day, was there was a continuous nod to the East in the speech that he was um, giving. He spoke about um, how Ireland is supportive of uh, EU membership for the Western Balkans. He also spoke that while we were now a net contributor to the EU budget, that we were prepared to pay more for um, things like structural funds for Eastern nations to ensure that they could unlock their potential. So once again, there was a, a political message there. I mean, he did cover familiar ground on protecting the cap budget. He did talk about um, hands off our tax. He did talk about things like um, anything to do with multinationals and tax erosion should be dealt with by the OECD, which one economist said was the slowest of slow trains. So let's not do it within the European model. Let's leave it way out there in the Atlantic. But behind it, what he was really saying was we're looking for new friends, I guess, um, in a very changing world. And Varadkar's comments did get a reasonable amount of coverage on that day on the 6 and 9 o'clock news. This was taken as something important. But um, it's only a drop in the ocean in the context of Brexit. The amount of media that Brexit generates is just huge. And for me, it's not just the financial aspect, which continues to grab headlines for running back years. The um, EOSI, one think tank, was talking about how um, trade between Ireland and the UK could drop by a fifth if things go wrong. But for me, it's the question of the possibility of a return to violence, which is a real live issue, and the conflict in Northern Ireland emerging in some way. And just last week, the Justice Minister, Charlie Flanagan, said on RT's The Week in Politics that the greatest threat to the security of this state comes from dissident Republicans along the border, and a hard Brexit or a difficult Brexit could well feed into tensions and give rise to difficulties that none of us want. I, I think it's a real issue, and it is for maybe people of my age, because um, I do remember the conflict in Northern Ireland, and I reported from it on many dark days. And I remember one in particular, which was the 30th of October in 1993. And um, I was reporting from Belfast, and it was one week after a bomb had gone off in a fish shop. And uh, a bomber and nine civilians were killed, including two girls aged 7 and 13. And in Belfast, seven days later, there was fear on the streets because everyone knew that a massacre was going to occur in retaliation for what happened, and it was only a question when. And I remember that sense of people literally barricading themselves into their homes, of the streets being absolutely deserted, and this stomach-churning tension of waiting, waiting for something to happen. Now, in the event on that day, it didn't happen in Belfast, it happened in another city in Derry, when the UDA struck at Greysteel and shot dead eight people in a bar, including an 81-year-old man. So next month marks the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which was the culmination of a massive amount of work leading to the end of the conflict. And a whole generation has now grown up knowing only peace. And so it is a big concern when we hear of Brexit that some of that could be sundered, that you could actually go back to some form of um, violence again. But in saying all that, I do agree with um, the senior IEA fellow, Tony Brown, where he talked about that the balance is changing and that the future of Europe is beginning to take hold and be discussed in a much bigger way. And I'd like to commend the IIEA for leading the debate on that. The, particularly opening up to um, universities to talk to students about the type of EU that they're going to inherit. And I did some work with the Director General, um, Barry 
uh, where we went to Maynooth University talking to students about what is the Europe that they want, what do they want to see, what are the live issues for them. And I think ultimately what we're talking about is taking off our Brexit glasses and looking at Europe anew. And this is where we're really striving for. And to that end, the former Secretary General of the European Commission, Catherine Day, who some of you probably know, she held the position for a decade, she said in a speech in Dublin just in January that um, there are many forces challenging and shaping the European Union today. Brexit is only one of them. And while the departure of a big member state is a significant rupture, it's likely to have a time-limited impact on the European Union. And in short, what we need to do is to look beyond Brexit into those new alliances. And I think what we heard from Taoiseach Radkar in um, the European Parliament in Strasbourg was that message of us looking out and looking beyond. And I think that to a certain extent, when he, there was a nod to the East and the Eastern countries, Poland clearly is one of those countries that we are going to be looking to. It doesn't mean that we put all our eggs in one basket. Um, Leo Radkar, as well as being Strasbourg, recently travelled to Vienna, where he was meeting a new chancellor younger than himself, and someone, I believe, learned some of his English in Bray in County Wicklow, I believe. We can claim some um, credit for that. And obviously, as the UK leaves, some of the bigger member states will also be moving in to fill that vacuum, and Spain and Italy will be part of that. So I think it's um, a wonderful thing that we're doing today, and I think the IA is delighted, delighted to be able to do is to bring some of those European <laughs> perspectives here, because I think that um, what we need to know is... What are, um, what's going on in your countries? What's happening there? What forms the opinions that you have? What is it that the type of future that you believe um, is going to take hold? And what is it that we can learn from you? So as we form new alliances, they're taking root on the basis of real information and what's happening. So what I'd like to do now is to start off the speeches. We'll be speaking for 10 minutes, our guests, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Before we go any further, if I could just ask everyone to once again, just check your mobile phone if you have it on <laughs> silent, or maybe turn it on to um, airplane mode, please. So our first speaker is Agata Gustaya Jabowska. She's a senior research fellow with the Centre for European Reform, and she's going to speak to us right now. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and for having me again in Dublin. Um, I remember that the last time uh, I was here was in 2014 and I was asked to speak about Poland's race to the top in the European Union. Now, as you may imagine, you perhaps have noticed, many things have changed since then. Uh, Poland has elected a new government, a government which sadly um, antagonized some of its European uh, partners with its domestic reforms. But also one of Poland's greatest ally, and I imagine also Ireland's ally, is leaving the EU, and that is, of course, um, UK. And in my short intervention, I would like to capture this changing dynamics uh, that I just mentioned and offer you a central European perspective on the future of Europe post-Brexit. And I would like to organize my remarks around three issues. And first, uh, that would be the impact of Britain's departure uh, from the EU on the overall balance of powers. And second, I would like to look into the implications of this shift in balance of powers on uh, a standing of the Visegrad region, uh, that is the region that comprises Poland, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, though some say Czech Czechia these days, I don't really uh, like that new acronym, um, and Slovakia. And finally, if, uh, if the time allows, I would like to look into the implications of Brexit um, on the public debate in Poland about Poland's place in, in the EU. So without further ado, I will um, uh, uh, go into the first question. As you know, Britain used to be seen as, um, as the member states which opposed um, a draft EU legislation more often than any other member state. And despite its reputation as a blocker, it was still a member state that many other EU countries were reaching out to first when they were building uh, coalitions within the European Union. Now that means that Brexit will no doubt shift the balance of powers um, in the EU and it will actually shift, this balance, uh, shift uh, b the balance of powers towards the largest member states. And as you know, these are the member states which are often more vocal and more effective in pushing forward their 
initiatives. And I think that poses some challenges uh, for a number of uh, EU countries, including, I imagine, Ireland, but also Visegrad countries. Well, it poses challenges for countries which used to hide behind UK's back, or uh, for those countries which used to reach out to Britain whenever they were trying to build a coalition around certain initiatives. That basically means that those member states will have to be now more, will have to now more forcefully push forward um, their opinions, um, or they will have to look for new coalition partners. And I understand that this is actually what Ireland has already been doing, touring European capitals and and sort of uh, 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 building new uh, alliances. Now. That actually uh, brings me to the second point I wanted to make. Uh, well, where does it leave? Uh, uh, where does it leave Visegrad region as such? Well, I must say that Britain's departure. And I don't think that will surprise you. Uh, Britain's uh, departure from the EU uh, makes the Visegrad countries quite uneasy about their standing uh, in the EU. And I would like to focus on uh, two reasons or sort of two aspects of this uneasiness. Well, first one is that um, a Brexit <coughs> will, um, that post-Brexit, um, uh, basically the power will shift not only to the largest member states, but to the Euro member states. Post-Brexit, the Eurozone will amount for 85% of the EU economic output and also 76% of the EU's population. Yeah? And, and basically, as you uh, probably know, out of those four Visegrad countries, only Slovakia is a Eurozone member. Uh, neither Hungary nor Czech Republic nor Poland, Poland even though they are legally uh, committed to join the Eurozone, they haven't really rushed so far to adopt the common currency. But having said this, any prospect of future sort of further deeper Eurozone uh, integration means that basically uh, makes those member states quite concerned about their status in the EU. They simply worry that uh, if there was a deeper Eurozone integration, they could be pushed uh, on the margins uh, of the Eurozone project. In a way, of course, we can debate it later on, but in a way, some of those concerns are not without merit. Um, this is because uh, you know, newly elected, very energetic President Macron has pushed for certain Eurozone reform, and he seems to believe, he seems to be convinced that in the longer term, Eurozone needs separate institutions, including a finance minister who would be in command over separate Eurozone budget, which would help to sort of facilitate structural reforms in Euro area countries, but which also would help to soothe sort of uh, uh, the painful, um, uh, the painful uh, uh, reforms and also mitigate any future, uh, uh, any uh, future crisis. Now, of course, this, ma this makes those Visegrad countries worried that if the Eurozone were to go for its separate Euro, Euro, Euro institutions, they, uh, they would be out of the uh, uh, out of the table. Now, of course, I think Germany has been quite a significant, if not key, into this very delicate balancing act between euro ins and euro outs. It used to sort of drag euro outs, and particularly Poland, it used to uh, advocate for a greater openness of the uh, eurozone governance. As you remember, uh, Chancellor Merkel played a significant role in the elevation of. Um, uh, uh, Donald Tusk as a European Council president, but also the Euro Summit president, yeah, which was, I think, uh, quite significant at that moment. But uh, the truth is, Chancellor Merkel is not going to be there forever. Uh, uh, some actually say that she might not even serve till the end of the next uh, coalition uh, government, and we don't really know whether any future German government would be would have such a great understanding of the concerns of of euro out or at least pre ins yeah, which haven't um, adopted the common currency. So that's one one example, and another one is. It seems to me there is, there is this concern in some Central European countries that post-Brexit there will be 
not only shift to the largest member states, but there will be actually a shift of balance of power towards the supranational EU institutions. As you remember, the UK has been a staunch supporter of a strong voice of member states in the EU decision-making process. Yeah, it has opposed the Spitzenkandidaten process, it has felt uneasy, or I should actually say it used to feel uneasy, uh, about uh, a quite assertive European Parliament. Now, uh, Central European countries, particularly Visegrad countries, they, it seems to me they, they might feel that post-Brexit post uh, it will be much more difficult to counterbalance the influence of supra, supranational institutions. And I think that has influenced already their thinking about the vision, vision of Europe. And perhaps I should just uh, make, a, uh, uh, make a very brief disclaimer here. Immediately after accession, Central European countries were uh, uh, staunch supporters of the partnership with supranational institutions. Yeah, and I actually think I said it even in 2014, because the supranational institutions, the European Parliament and the European Commission, while they usually actually present or sort of help, uh, uh, help um, uh, those newer and perhaps smaller member states. Yeah? Uh, but this has changed. Uh, Central uh, European governments, Visegrad countries, they went now more UK type intergovernmental, yeah, I would say. Of course, again, we can debate whether this is a good or, 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 or a bad thing. And, and as I said, I mean, those concerns have, have been reflected in their um, vision um, a vision of, of future of Europe in their January statement of the Visegrad uh, region. Um, uh, the Visegrad countries said that they didn't like the idea of the Spitzenkandidaten process, uh, mainly because they think that would undermine the role of member states in the uh, sort of in elevating and nominating uh, or deciding actually who is the future European Council president and they also worry that basically that would push the process would push the independent European Commission into the arms of the European Parliament and what is also quite interesting uh, is that those in, countries in one minute in one minute, yes, uh, uh, it, it, that those countries have also uh, um, have also argued that basically the European Council, yeah, which governs uh, individual leaders of individual member states, should be the body which should be setting the priorities and the direction of the European Union, and particularly Poland here. Uh, uh, floated, uh, has floated an idea that perhaps the European Council should be an institution in charge of uh, uh, solving out any sort of uh, controversial issues, perhaps like the refugee crisis, because I think it's quite important to underline that the decision in 2015 to push for a vote on the relocation scheme, despite the uh, heavy opposition of Central European countries, uh, it, it hasn't sort of played out well. Uh, and final point, uh, 30 seconds, mm. perhaps. 10. 50. <laughs> <laughs> well, then perhaps in this case, I will leave my final point uh, for later, because I just wanted to, to uh, very briefly say on how Brexit actually affected a domestic debate uh, about uh, uh, Poland's place in the EU. Um, basically, Brexit has made waves, uh, as I'm being told, in Ireland, but also in Poland, and posed questions on whether it would consolidate the 27 or uh, whether it would uh, sort of trigger or, trigger or result in a domino uh, effect. And that, that is something that has been also used by both the current Polish government uh, but also by the, uh, by the political opposition. The political opposition, and I will stop there, the political opposition has uh, uh, pointed into the direction of Brexit as a sort of warning yeah, that any anti-European uh, uh, narrative <coughs> could perhaps not lead to poll exit, but perhaps could lead to Poland's marginalization on the, on, on the EU stage. And of course, the current government has used Brexit as a, 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 as a case for reforming the EU and the EU institutions in a way which would obviously suit um, uh, uh, the government. But um, 
And this is where we all sort of come down to Brexit and uh, David Cameron's reform yes. uh, agenda. Uh, we can see uh, some of those ideas being floated by the by the Polish government these days, like the idea of, of red cards for national okay. uh, uh, parliaments. But just ju just to finish on, on, on this note, uh, just to finish on this note, uh, basically I think that the EU has been very clear that after, uh, after Britain decides to leave the EU, the deal is off the table. So I would argue that also countries like Poland should simply turn the page and focus on on building fences and uh, looking for for the EU which works for all the 27 not for the few excellent I think that's a theme which will be picked up in the discussion <laughs> our, next, our next speaker here is Paul Maria Sturk deputy director of the Barcelona Center for International Affairs Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, uh, Guillen, for, for having me here first time in, in, in the Institute and the Director General. Thank you very much for, for having me. I will build a bit on what Agatha was, uh, was mentioning and, and have first a few uh, comments on the shape of European integration, which I think are worth, uh, worth mentioning now, and then focus in on Spain uh, and, the, and, and, and the role that Spain can have in this, in this refurbished EU after, after Brexit. Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, the big question that keeps worrying me uh, for the last few uh, months, uh, if not years, uh, uh, since Brexit is, is whether that is an opportunity or not. Uh, is it an opportunity for uh, the EU or is something that will lead to uh, a, a bad status of uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking about the future of the EU and thus uh, pessimism about, about this great, uh, great uh, uh, political experiment that the EU is. And, and, and first of all, my first concern is that most of the debate now is focusing on the idea of multi-speed Europe. And most of the debates about multi-speed Europe, we have to take into account that it is a method, not an end game of the integration process. A method, I mean, which is means that this is a way to refine how the EU functions. But in any case, is putting forward new ideas about what the EU is, why it should survive, what is the end goal, and why, why do we want to uh, remain together despite one of us, the UK, is living. So all these big questions remain unanswered. And if you look at the different kind of crisis portfolio that the EU is, 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 is micromanaging for, for, for the last few years, uh, we have no end result in either of those crises. Uh, we have no idea about what the future shape of the Eurozone will be, whether we want more integration, more supranational uh, powers for, uh, for the Commission in, that, Eurozone, in th that reformed Eurozone, whether that will mean Eurobonds or that will mean fiscal transfers, whether we will stick to austerity. austerity. All these debates are not happening. So the same kind of uh, di discussions that we used to have before the Eurozone, uh, before the Brexit crisis on the Eurozone are still there. So, so this is not being solved. Of course, the same applies for Schengen uh, and, for the, and for the reform of Schengen. We're not discussing about the joint asylum policy. It is there in the picture. Someone might want to pick it up, but it is not something that is out of the, uh, in, in the, in, in the discussed by the, by the, by the leaders. Um, what, what this means uh, to me is that uh, perhaps we are putting too much emphasis on the method, not enough, not enough on, the, on, the, on the end of the process, uh, precisely at a time when citizens are asking for more of those answers. Hmm? We are building uh, on these dynamics of being studied largely in the literature on the politicization of the European Union. The politicization of the European Union basically means that citizens care about Europe, not only seen from their national perspectives. They care about the future of European integration because they know perfe perfectly that what happens in Germany has an impact on Spain. What happens in, 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 in the refugee crisis in the countries of, of the East and Central Europe has an impact on the rest of the, of the of the uh, of the EU members and what happens in Italy what happened in Italy yesterday will certainly have an effect on the future reform of the European Union so in any case all these questions remain remain unanswered the big thing here is whether multi-speed if not providing an answer to the future of European integration can kind of put forward a necessary rethink on the rebalancing of the EU. And this is where I built from, from Agatha's uh, very good comments on, on, on the, on the um, power dynamics in, in, in the EU. I am 
somehow skeptical to the view that uh, groupings of countries are kind of uh, behind any EU integration processes and the EU is becoming more sub-regional. The V4 has a position on the refugee crisis, true, but it remains divided within. Mm -hmm. It's not the same Poland and Hungary than the Czech Republic. Huh? So they are not exactly on the same lines on the future of the EU. They might agree on the relocation scheme and on the quotas scheme and, and, and reject that, that scheme. But there, it's not that clear that they form a solid subgrouping of countries in the future shape of the EU. The core Europe, France and Germany, are deeply divided at the end of the story about Eurozone reform. They have very dif different perceptions about risk sharing and risk reduction. And of course, this implies that the core EU is not so united on the future of the European Union either, and thus it leaves the question of what EU do we want unanswered. And the same applies for something that I don't like to use, but which is pejoratively used, which is the MET club huh? and the Mediterranean countries. I prefer to call it the southern, the southern uh, countries. And we've seen with the southern front of the European Union, and Spain belongs to that southern front, that they have not agreed either on any of the big crises. Spain did the best it could to differentiate itself from Greece during the Euro crisis. Spain is not Greece. Spain can follow the dynamics of the core Europe and Spain will reform itself and will be the good pupil of uh, uh, Eurozone, um, uh, Eurozone reforms and, and austerity policies. So in that regard, Spain and Greece have nothing to, to, to do together. Italy said Italy is not Spain because Italy knew perfectly that if it followed the, Spain, the, Spain's, uh, uh, the S Spain's logic, of course, this would backfire internally. We've seen that yesterday and with the Cinque Stelle uh, being the biggest force. Uh, if you do not count Salvini and, and Berlusconi together, but in any case. Um, so this grouping of countries is, are, are actually happening and you have different sub-regional configurations, but in any case are united among themselves. This means that there is no clear picture about what the role, uh, the role these, these groupings will have in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the future EU. What all of these groupings have in common is that they have rather made centrifugal dynamics permeate into the European Union integration process. What we, have, what we are not seeing, seeing is anyone actually carrying the big flag of the EU integration of the future because of these deep divisions among, among themselves. This leads me to Spain and, and, and a few words, and I don't know how, how much time I have left, but four minutes, okay, more than enough, more than enough. Um, what's the position of Spain in this rebalancing of the European Union? And here I would say that uh, Spain is deeply divided on Brexit. This leads me, of course, to Brexit as well. Why? Because on the one hand, uh, Spain sees Brexit as an opportunity. It's been mentioned before in the introduction, Spain sees Brexit as an opportunity in the sense that, of course, there is a void there that someone has to fill in. Um, Spain has been out of the picture of European integration for so many years. First, because of the economic crisis, of course, focusing internally and the effects of the economic crisis on the internal political configuration of Spain, and second, because of Catalonia. It has gone out of the, of, the, of, the, of the picture of thinking big about the EU and thus now is thinking whether it can play hard and can play a big role in this, in this refurbished EU. At the same time, it has always been a very pro-EU country, very pro-integration country. So it will not see multi-speed Europe in in, in very positive terms, if this means that multi-speed Europe is kind of the backdoor for disintegration or for different speeds and thus someone being left behind. Because Spain, at the end of the day, has, is very much afraid that it will be left behind, that Spain will be left behind. So it has kind of mixed feelings about the opportunity that Brexit and multi-speed represent for Spain and feeling that void that the UK has left and Poland is leaving. Um, and, uh, and also uh, it is divided in the sense that it will still be very pro-European, pro-integrationist. So in this configuration of uh, kind of uh, uh, dialectics between both, uh, between both positions, it is where, um, where Spain is trying to kind of have a role in the refurbished core of the European Union. Spain has been arguing for the last years or months that uh, the core Europe cannot be France and Germany only. Core Europe needs to be France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And this is what Versailles meant, basically. The Versailles meeting was exactly about being, uh, having a more kind of 
uh, um, a, a widen a, a wider uh, core core Europe. So most likely it will follow on that uh, in that direction of, of being being put in the in the middle of the of the picture. That being said, of course, the stakes for Spain of Brexit are very high. This here, Spain and Ireland, we were discussing that during the lunch, are very similar. They're both very exposed to Brexit. Uh, the largest number of expats, of UK expats, is residing in Spain. So, of course, there is a, a human dimension to Brexit, which is very important. It fears Spain that it will have to become a net contributor to the EU budget in the next in the next negotiations, and uh, of course, in terms of FDI and tourism, Spain has a big uh, a big uh, has big stakes on, on 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 Brexit. Not to mention the Gibraltar issue, which is also kind of a very bilateral important problem for for the UK uh, for the UK and Spain. No? So, all being put together, um, what I think is that if we are aware that these groupings of countries have not have a united position towards the reform of the EU and that Spain is kind of divided on, on, on its position, I am afraid that the most centrifugal dynamics that have been happening in, in the EU for the last few years since the crisis are likely to stay among us for the next uh, few years. And these, of course, will be uh, the, big, uh, the big discussions that will, that will take place from Brexit, the European Parliament elections, and for the years to come. But I will leave it here, and then perhaps we can elaborate a bit more later. Thank you very much, Paul. I hope you don't mind the short bios. It's just more interesting what you said than what you did. So our next speaker is Paul Schmidt, Director General of the Austrian Society for European Politics. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, I will, uh, in my presentation, I will try to use uh, some of the, of the points that were already made and, and, and give you my, my uh, give you an, a, a perspective through Austrian lenses, so to speak. Um, Brexit, of course, how, how could it not be mentioned? But it's time li limiting, the impact is time limiting. There was an impact also on, on public opinion in Austria. And, and I will tell you the story. Um, we, uh, at our institute, we do a lot of opinion polls. And right after the, the 23rd of June, 2016, after the vote, uh, we did an opinion poll. We've been doing this since the existing of, of the office. So there, there we have a timeline of around more than 50 opinion polls, always asking, do you want to stay or do you want to go? And um, um, Austria was somehow uh, always in, in, in the circle of those countries named that could actually follow, follow uh, UK on its, on its path to leave the European Union. And, and since Austria joined the European Union, in fact, we, had, we joined with a two-third majority uh, uh, with a referendum in 94, we joined in 95, and then we had a, a majority of, of 66 up to 75, depending on what was happening on a daily basis. Uh, of people in favor of, of, of EU membership. So we did a, a, a opinion poll right after the, the, the Brexit vote, and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, those wanting to stay, the number that, of those that want, want, want to remain went up uh, 14 percentage points. So that was huge, in fact. If, if you look at the last uh, 22 years, that, that was a huge amount. And those uh, wanting to leave actually went down around to eight percentage point. And um, we were not the only one who did that opinion poll. There were others in Austria as well. And that was at a time when the far right uh, FPÖ uh, political party in Austria actually played with the idea of, of a referendum on this issue. And, and uh, they quickly changed their mind, in fact, because they, they saw that to be su successful in national elections, you have to be much more moderate. Uh, there's no place for uh, romanticism, it seems, at least uh, concerning that question in Austria. And also concerning the euro, for example, this is not an issue at all. At the beginning, it was, again, uh, this, uh, the right-wingers who, who tried to return to, to the, the Austrian currency, which was the shilling, but uh, they changed their mind because they saw they, they saw that in the opinion polls uh, this this is no uh, this uh, this is not a choice uh, that, that 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 Austrians would actually go for because they 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 are pragmatic 
they, they accept that their currency is the euro. They see advantages and disadvantages, but uh, going back to another currency in a world which we have today is something that they not really want to go in. Um, this being said, uh, it doesn't mean that there's not criticism, there's not skepticism concerning European integration. Of course there is, but um, there's also a pragmatism that no one wants to leave, that we want to change the, de the design of the European Union, uh, but being uh, a member of the family and not, not leaving. Um, we've uh, had uh, also, um, oh, we've also asked the question whether Austrians would like to see the, the UK leave the European Union. We, we've always had a majority of people saying, of course not. Um, okay, but Brexit, as well as the economic and financial crisis and the migration issue, triggered a reform process in Europe, triggered a debate on the future of Europe. With, which started, in fact, on, on a European level with the different uh, white papers, speeches, reform scenarios, and which needs to, to, to go down to the national, regional, and local level in order to make it happen. We've seen many, many um, uh, speeches, but uh, we're not so quick on substance, I would say. It takes... We've seen also co uh, council conclusions in Bratislava at, at the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the European Union in Rome, uh, with um, member states showing their commitment, but it's just it's words, and we're waiting for the deeds. Uh, and we don't know whether, whether um, member states would actually deliver on it. And uh, this is where I think the Macron speech was really important. Because one thing is that um, you react to something on the table, put forward by a commission president, for example, or you don't really engage in the debate because it's just a paper and it's, it's, it's on a European supranational level that it's institutional topics, it's, it's an elite debate. But the other thing is having a, an important member state and, and, and the, the, the president uh, of, of, of uh, France, um, putting forward his vision and asking for, uh, for, for national democratic assemblies to discuss these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, the European Commission has been doing that in, in many, many, many member states with their citizens' dialogues, but it, it's a difference if it does the European Commission or if it's actually uh, done and organized uh, by the member states. Um, I can tell you from our experience um, we, uh, we, we closely cooperate with, with uh, the, the delegation of the European Commission in, in, in Vienna, in Austria, but if we organize something with a commissioner, it's much harder for us to, to draw a big crowd, uh, crowd of people than if we organize th something with, with a, a member of, of, of the national government just because their faces are known, they are in the newspapers. So in order to get this debate going, you actually need those kind of people. You need national ownership um, and uh, to, to get a discussion going and, and to get the implementation of one of the other vision, actually, uh, to make it happen. Um, it's interesting to see that Macron put his ideas forward at, at a time where, where we didn't, see, uh, uh, didn't yet have a stable government in Germany. So Germany was on hold. Uh, and everyone was waiting for Germany to, to, to react uh, to these proposals. Um, and if you read the, the, the coalition agreement, I agree with Paul that there are divisions between Germany and, and, and France concerning the future of the Eurozone. But if you read the, the coalition agreement in Germany, you have a, uh, not only because uh, it's the first chapter which is on the European Union, which is uh, if you compare it to other coalition agreements in other countries, uh, also in my country, uh, which is quite quite surprising, positively surprising, if I may say, um, but uh, they go quite far in in, in in what they consider important to have. They uh, and and Paul, you have, you've said that Ireland also is, is is ready to do so. They they committed themselves to to raise their contributions to the EU budget, which is, which is quite interesting. 
Um, you have other countries who, who, who don't do that, who have a different position. They um, talked about the importance of, of migration, but not only in the sense of managing the external borders, but also uh, about uh, helping the transition countries, also about um, tackling migration, tackling the root causes for migration. So they had a much broader, broader perspective on, on this. But also, of course, uh, uh, trying to improve the security situation within the European Union. The social dimension was really important in this, in this is really important in this coalition agreement. And also uh, in, the, in the Macron speech, fair mobility, fair mobility, intra-European mobility, that's something very crucial for, for Austria. Um, the question of fair taxation, tax competition, uh, how to tackle uh, tax evasion, avoidance, tax fraud, something very important also for Austria. Because if you look at the geography and the different states of development of the economies of the neighboring countries of Austria, you can see that there's a lot of competition going on, having all the neighboring countries in the single market without uh, borders to, to trade, which is a good thing, everyone benefits, but there's, there's a race to the bottom uh, where, where we, we all lose because it takes away room for, for, for mis fiscal maneuvers. Uh, interesting, the enforcement of European values, something, something important, something that the, the German Chancellor, also future Chancellor, uh, talked also about in relation to the EU budget. The question of EU enlargement, further in EU, in EU enlargement, you have a new Western Balkan strategy of the European Commission, is, is, is something which is very important uh, for Austria, having been traditionally close to, to the countries of the Western Balkans. And, and now we have a date. I mean, it's a moving target, okay, but at least we have a date defined, which is 2025. And this is not only a date, at least this is the way we understand, it's not only a date about uh, the countries of the Western Balkan getting ready in the reforms. Two minutes? One. One minute. <laughs> so I have to be much quicker. <laughs> getting ready in, in, uh, in the reform, reforms on the path to accession. But the European Union has to be ready. We have to have our reforms well in place and working if we want to further enlarge. Because I can tell you from our data, no one in the country which I know best wants to enlarge the European Union if we have not really managed to consolidate um, the, the European Union. Now, uh, I can talk about Austria's um, European perspective and priorities maybe in the second round. Yeah. Uh, just, just one more thing. Um, That's, that would go too far to, to talk about the Vichy God now. That's the third round. But, <laughs> but, but the, um, summing, up. What, summing up, concluding, w Austria would like to see itself or perceives itself as a bridge builder. We want to mediate between these new divides between East and West. Um, that would be our standpoint. I don't know if we actually can, can, can play that role, but that's something to be discussed. Thank you very much, Paul.